Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we're going to have an open-ended conversation with Bernardo Castrop, who has been a guest on New Thinking Aloud nine times previously. Bernardo is a scientist and a philosopher. He is the author of Rationalist Spirituality, Meaning in Absurdity, Dreamed Up Reality, Why Materialism is Baloney, Brief Peaks Beyond, More Than Allegory, The Idea of the World, a Multidisciplinary Argument for the Mental Nature of Reality, and Decoding Schopenhauer's Metaphysics. Bernardo is based in the Netherlands, and now I'll switch over to the internet interview. Welcome, Bernardo. We haven't spoken for about six months, so it's a real pleasure to be back with you. I'm very happy to be here again, Jeff. Uh, I I love our chats. You know, I've always been meaning to ask you about your life as a public intellectual. I know in the past you worked as a computer scientist and then you switched over to philosophy. And uh, I've always been curious about what what drew you to make that change, and uh, where is it taking you now? I have had many lives uh, in one. I've been a scientist, I've been an engineer, I've been a corporate manager doing high-tech strategy, and I've been a philosopher now for quite a while. Um, yeah, it, uh, the, the turns that uh, life takes, um, if you ask me, is this something I planned or I decided? No, no, it's where life is taking me and I'm happy to go. It's one of the things I've learned in my life is to, to be happy to go where life takes you. Um, so now, most recently, I, uh, philosophy has become my, my full-time job as opposed to something I do next to high technology strategy. And, uh, and it's quite exciting. So, in other words, during the period when you wrote, I think, the last seven or eight books, you were actually also working as a business consultant to support yourself. Yeah, actually, uh, I've written all my books, including the one that will come out only late next year. So, there are two unpublished books that I have written also uh, earlier this year uh, while I was doing uh, high-tech strategy, you know, high-technology strategy. And only from this summer on, I left to focus on uh, setting up a new foundation in the field of uh, philosophy, metaphysics in particular, trying to have a sort of a, a, a approach to metaphysics that is uh, based on reason and and empirical evidence as opposed to introspection. Not because we think that introspection is less valuable. No, on the contrary, you know me well by now, uh, Jeff. You know that I consider introspection perhaps the key avenue to knowledge. Um, But we noticed in the culture that um, unless you are putting forward a materialist metaphysics, people who talk about alternatives like idealism, uh, cosmopsychism, they are always associated with introspection. In other words, with spirituality, with meditation. Um, And we think that uh, there is a very, very strong objective case to make for idealism, for this notion that all reality is mental and in essence, uh, that does not depend on any introspective insight whatsoever. It's pure out of reasoning and laboratory empirical evidence. So we want to emphasize that and bring that message to the culture. In, in other words, you consider yourself a rationalist. It's always tricky to say that I am this or I am that because it seems to exclude all other things, right? I am a rationalist too, um, by, by character, uh, by nature, uh, not necessarily by a deliberate choice. It's just how I'm put together. It's in my genes. It's in my DNA. I can't escape it. And I'm in peace with that as well. I'm okay with the fact that I have a rationalist tendency. But uh, our motivation is basically uh, what we perceive as an imbalance in the culture. Uh, Because it seems that everybody who pursues reason and evidence is perceived as falling in the materialist camp. And people who who think along the lines of cosmopsychism and idealism, they are immediately uh, labeled uh, spiritual people. And 
I'm fine with that, but I don't want to grant implicitly to materialism that if we follow reason and evidence, then, then materialism is the obvious conclusion. I think it is not at all. I think it's, in fact, the worst conclusion that you can extract uh, from, from reason and evidence. So we see an imbalance and we want to help us sort of diminish it a little bit, reduce the imbalance. Now, you've used this term cosmopsychism a couple of times. It's actually not a term I'm familiar with, so maybe you could give me a little background uh, about it. In modern philosophy, and now I'm going to say something that's my opinion, and I, I can already see many academic philosophers you know, screaming at the screen right now. Um, in modern philosophy, people like to give new names to old things to make it sound modern and leading edge and, you know, something innovative that can give you lots of papers instead of something that has been talked about and rejected before. Uh, Cosmopsychism is the new fancy name for what we have all known as objective idealism for a couple of hundred uh, years now. There is no essential difference. Maybe if you go down into um, the hair splitting of philosophical concepts, then maybe you find uh, uh, differences. But it's it's the age old idea that uh, um, the cosmos as a whole is psychic in nature. In other words, that nature is mental in nature. doesn't mean that it is in your mind or my mind alone. It means that it is mental at a transpersonal level. And what we see as the physical universe is just how these transpersonal mental processes present themselves to us on the screen of perception. And, and, and there's nothing more to it than that. Recently, through reading over your blogs, which I've really enjoyed, I see that you refer to your position as analytical idealism, I assume, as opposed to objective idealism. Analytic idealism is a, a formulation, a particular line of argument to defend both objective and subjective idealism. And now, now to explain why I'm defending both uh, would require a little bit more elaboration. Um, but um, I, I, I don't like creating new names for old ideas, so I stick to idealism. The problem I have faced over the years is that uh, if I just say idealism, I seem to be speaking for a whole, a whole lot of other people that I don't want to misappropriate. I don't want to misappropriate the particular position of uh, Bishop Barclay or, or Hegel. So, and I have been um, criticized for that uh, because every time I say, well, my position is idealism, people say, well, that's your idealism. Don't speak for the rest of the idealists. So I figured, fine, I will add a prefix. <laughs> I will stick to idealism because I don't like new, wo new words. But I would say my particular line of argument for it, my particular way of defending it, I would, I'm happy to call it analytic idealism because, well, it is analytic. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the hoodie or sweatshirt that you're wearing, and I'm pretty sure that if you were to stand up, it would have the design that you've, you've created, a coat of arms that explains. Would you mind like standing up again so the viewers can see it clearly and maybe talking sure, a little bit sure. more about it? Uh, you can find it on my website. It is quite complex, and as a symbol, it's hard to, to, to explain it uh, uh, quickly. But it basically embodies the idea of idealism. Uh, the, the butterfly shape is the symbol for psyche in Greek mythology, which is mind. Uh, and the mirror in the middle of the butterfly is an appeal to, well, it's a symbol for self-reflection. When mind becomes aware of itself as a conscious uh, agent. And the book is a symbol for manifestation. An open book is a medieval symbol for manifestation. So the idea is that uh, mind is manifestation and that self-reflection is what allows it to rise beyond itself, like this little peak, this little alp uh, uh, with a church on top, which is the notion that mind through self-reflection and can go beyond its own manifestation and sort of... Uh, cognize itself as an agent, uh, which is the whole thing behind analytic idealism, the idea that manifestation is mental and that human metacognition is a telos of nature, is what nature is striving towards. And then you have two animals on, on the sides 
ho- holding up the book. Yeah, one is an European lynx, and the other one is a weasel. Uh, and the idea is that uh, the lynx is a very sharp-sighted animal. So y- the lynx sees clearly. And, uh, and and that's the symbolism for, you know, if you see clearly, you, you will see mind underlying nature. And the weasel is a symbol for a spiritual warrior. Weasels are known for being able to to uh, kill prey many times bigger than themselves. Um, and and they are very pig-headed in a sense. When they put something in their minds, you know, you, <laughs> they go for it. And uh, and that's an allusion to the idea that to be an idealist today, you're going against the mainstream. You're going against a much bigger opponent. But if you're steady fast and you, and you are you you, ha- you have clarity of vision, uh, you may uh, defeat uh, that opponent. So all of this, and there's a lot more and encoded into into one simple image <laughs> it's a beautiful coat of arms and uh, i'm very happy to share it with our viewers uh, you know i recently read a uh, one of your blog essays in which you talked about the anti-establishment feeling and i get the impression that that weasel in in particular is, is sort of a representative of of you as a, a a person not attached to any large institutions now setting up a a small foundation, but you're going after the largest metaphysical idea that has basically enchanted Western civilization and much of Eastern civilization for some 500 years. Yeah, um, there is no other way uh, to go to go about it, right? I mean, that's that's the opponent. The size of the error our culture has made is just ginormous, and the momentum behind it is ginormous. It's like trying to stop a freight train with your hands. Um, on the other hand, I you see, I do what I do not because I've thought about it and decided that this is what I need to do. It. It's what I need to do. I just feel it in my bone, and it's not like I really have a choice. And and that gives me a sort of peace of mind because it's not my call anyway. This is how I feel. You know what I mean? It's not like I regret this later because I didn't have a choice to begin with. So I I have such a peace of mind that if this whole thing amounts to precisely zero at the end, I can still tell to myself my deathbed. Well, I did what I had to do. I didn't have an option. So it's not my responsibility, you know. I I, I, I allowed that which wanted to come to the world through me to come. And, and if that led to nothing, it's not my fault. Sorry, I would still die in peace. <laughs> 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 well, I, <laughs> your, your attitude sort of reminds me of, um, I think maybe it, it reminds me of Spinoza actually, in his notion that we have to simply accommodate ourselves to uh, the will of the divine and then uh, we're at peace with ourselves. Uh, But I also wonder, does this mean that you're denying free will? I think individual free will, the way our culture talks about it, is is a red herring in the sense that um, Look, um, we use the word free will as something that is different from randomness and is also different from determination, from necessity. But there is no semantic space in between these two. Uh, These two extremes are all there is. There's nothing between uh, either your choices are random, which is not what we mean by free will, or they are determined by something. Yeah, but then it's not really free, right? Um, I think what we mean by free will is when our choices are determined by something that we don't identify ourselves with. And then we have the feeling that it's determined by an outside agency that forces itself on us. And then the question is, what are us? Do do us even exist to begin with? And and, and that's not something that you can argue rationally very well you know, and convince everybody of of what my position is or what I think. But I've come to accept that Bernardo Castro doesn't even exist, really. So what are we talking about when we say that Bernardo Castro has free will? Who who has free will? Where is him? <laughs> know what I mean? Um, and, and, and you might say, well, this is devastating for one sense of meaning. I would say, on the contrary, 
on the contrary, it's the, it, it is such a freedom that you have when you, now, not, not even when you understand this, but when you embody this um, naturally, without effort, uh, without going through you know, a month-long meditation to convince yourself that this is the case. No, when it just, when you allow it to just come through you without any effort, spontaneously, and uh, and that's where I am now. I mean, it took a while to get to this point. I I came here kicking and screaming and suffering all the way along, but um, this year I feel, hey. It's changing. I I I feel a a lightness of being to to misquote Milan Kundera, uh, a lightness of being that's not unbearable at all. <laughs> if you know <laughs> what I mean, it's well, the non unbearable. It's the bearable lightness of being. <laughs> I I do know because that's what I do with the, the new thinking aloud, and I do it th- under the auspices of a small foundation. So there there is a sense in in which I feel that. My existence is uh, parallel to yours in in some ways. And it's very joyful. Very, very. But let me probe a little deeper with you, or maybe a better way to put it is a little more shallower. Uh, be- because when you say Bernardo Castro doesn't exist, that's a very deep idea. Very deep. In, indeed, but at a more shallow level, uh, Bernardo Castrop is a legal entity. You have a birth certificate, and uh, you you're setting up a, a corporation uh, or a, an, a foundation. So, in a legal sense, Bernardo Castrop certainly does exist. And um, but coming back to your essay on anti-establishment feeling. You express a lot of sympathy for anti-establishment sentiments, and and you notice that they're very pervasive these days, both coming from the left and from the right politically. At the same time, I see you warning that in many instances, anti-establishment sentiment is reaching beyond uh, the bounds of, of science and rationality. I think there are two gigantic errors we can make when our collective, quote, unconscious, you know what I mean by unconscious, it's not unconscious at all, but okay, I'll, I'll surrender to the to the colloquial uh, phrase, when our human collective unconscious sort of makes a move, it's, it's, a, it's a seismic move, and there are two dramatically dangerous ways of going about it. One is to deny it, is to say it is not legitimate. It is invalid. It shouldn't exist. It can be ignored. They are the, uh, what was the word that was used? Uh, The deplorables. Now, this is a terrible mistake because what you're trying to do is uh, 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 unnatural amputation of a very, very alive part of the collective human psyche. Um, and by by severing it that way and ignoring it, you just make it stronger. Um, uh, you just make it um, desperate for, for gaining recognition of its own existence. Uh, you have to look at it and say, you have a right to exist. I'm not going to give you free reign, but you have a right to exist and you have a point of view. Now, the other dramatic error is to say, this is the next greatest thing under the sun. Let's go fully for it. Let's not think carefully about it. It's the next revolution. We are going to have it our way and to hell with the past, to hell with the traditions, with the norms, with political correctness and all that. That's terrible as well. And um, I think our species has proven over time that we are very bad at finding balance. We oscillate between extremes. And uh, and that's the greatest danger uh, of today. Look, if there was no anti-establishment sentiment, nobody would be hearing me talk to you right now because I would be completely irrelevant because we all know that materialism is true, right? That's what's been pumped down from the elites for a couple of centuries now. We all know that. So... Who is Bernardo Castro anyway? He's a deplorable. Um, so that's one uh, uh, extreme. Um, the other extreme is to say, well, because science has made mistakes and because some people who have self-elected 
to speak for science are idiots and confuse science with materialism. Because of that, we are going to deny climate science, we are going to deny the effectiveness of vaccines, which is probably the single most important advancement we've made to, to increase our average life expectancy a lot more than any cancer therapy uh, or, or a heart procedure ever invented. Um, so we throw away a very, very, very important baby uh, with the bathwater. I think these two extremes are disastrous and we are flirting uh, uh, always with one of them. Right now we are flirting with the other one. And I, I look upon this with a lot of worry. One of uh, the essays that you wrote, a letter to Bill Gates, was about nuclear power and that one uh, I found most interesting because you're suggesting that given the uh, increase of the planetary population, I think you suggest it's likely to level off at uh, 11 billion people on, on this planet. The only possible way to have a, a sustainable and let's even call it a green revolution is to rely on nuclear power of all things. Absolutely. Uh, yes, the models show that uh, we should level off at about 100 billion people in 2050. Did you say 100 billion? Sorry, sorry, sorry. 11. <laughs> I don't know where I got this from. 11 billion people by 2050. Uh, and not only that, uh, these 11 billion people will want to have the level of comfort and the lifestyle of the average American or the average European. And, and, and that alone is, will put a lot more strain uh, on our environment. So now, short of uh, uh, unthinkable other solutions, we will have to find a way to keep 11 billion people alive in a meaningful way uh, in this planet of a limited size. Um, and the way to go about it is, for instance, uh, we have now a, a, a drinkable water crisis coming. Well, it's already there, but it can be a major crisis. So how do you solve this? Well, you need desalination plants to filter out seawater and produce drinkable water everywhere. We have the technology. What's the problem? Well, it consumes huge amounts of energy. Um, uh, the food crisis, uh, we should plant more so we can feed more people vegetables because, you know, meat production not only is extremely polluting, but uh, it's also extremely inefficient in terms of resource usage. So let's let's plant our cities with vertical farming, you know, make buildings where we can just plant stuff. And then we need to illuminate these crops artificially because, you know, each, each level is in the shadow of the other. Uh, so you gain space vertically, but you don't have the sun. Well, Great, let's use LEDs for that. We have the technology. What's the problem? Well, it takes huge amounts of energy. And you can go on and on. Recycling, great idea. We can recycle everything. But it takes huge amounts of energy to melt all that stuff and recycle it. So the, I think the only responsible way, or not, not to, I go beyond that, I think the only technically feasible way to achieve sustainability with 11 billion people going around this planet is to have ridiculously cheap uh, um, energy available everywhere. And the only option is nuclear power. And our preconceptions of nuclear power are, are have been set by accidents like Fukushima, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl. And But if you look at what happened, these are all reactors with technology built in the 50s and 60s, um, uh, uh, which was very precarious technology. These are what we call active safety reactors. If the safety system stop working, uh, then the reactor will explode. Uh, it will melt. But since then, there are so many other technologies. Uh, we have active safety reactors, traveling wavefront reactor, uh, 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 thorium reactors, not to mention fusion reactors, which are still far off in the future. But we have technologies today that work in such a way that if everything shuts down, including the safety systems, the reactor just stops. It cannot keep itself alive. So these would be perfectly safe, non-polluting alternatives, because some of these technologies use as fuel what the old reactors produced as waste. So not only are they not polluting, they could clean up the nuclear waste that we have already produced. But nobody will talk about it because it has become taboo. The word nuclear 
has become taboo and we are overlooking a technology that is right there in front of us. If only we would be allowed to experiment, to build prototypes, very safe technology. If I had 10 kids, I would live next door to one of these plants tomorrow. No problem. Um, and we could have a sustainable way of staying on this planet. But yeah, irrationality prevails, unfortunately. I uh, recall interviewing my uh, dear late friend, Dean Brown, who was a nuclear physicist. And uh, he maintained, this was 20 years ago or more, that the, the single biggest problem facing humanity that he saw was, what do we do with all the nuclear waste? Uh, so if that problem can be solved, that's, that's a huge uh, solution. You have nuclear technologies that don't produce waste. Uh, fusion, well, we are not there yet, but we probably will be there in 15 to 30 years, which is like the blink of an eye, right? It's tomorrow. It, it's 2050, you know, when we will plateau at 100 billion people, sorry, at 11 billion people. Um, and, and there are technologies, and, uh, and that's why you read this in a letter to Bill Gates. There's a company Bill Gates is investing in. Um, uh, and if that, te that technology works, it could consume nuclear waste and render it inert. Um, so my Bill Gates now is, of course, uh, totally busy with pandemic and vaccines and all that. And, okay, it's completely understandable. But if you ask me, uh, you know, what is the big problem? You know, we, we are worried with deadly problems, but comparatively small problems compared to what's coming after that. The waves that are coming after that are much bigger. And um, so it was my little attempt. I, I'm sure Bill Gates didn't even hear about my, my open letter to him. But I think we should not ignore um, the, the much bigger waves, the much bigger tsunamis that are coming, um, and we should brace ourselves for that and make it look, our only escape is a forward escape. It would be great if we could go back to nature and walk naked around and be hunter gatherers again, right? But we can't with 11 billion people on this planet. So like technology or not, it's too late to live without it. Uh, so we really have to have a forward escape. We have to go into technology faster and more intensive, intensively than ever before if we want to survive and be happy as a civilization, as a species we will survive. There, there's always the, the African Bushman, the, the, the Inuit, the Aboriginal. They, have, they know how to survive in the environment. They have the knowledge. We don't. If we lose our civilization, our culture, our technology, we, we're toast. So if you want to survive, we better embrace you know, technology. I have heard the argument, though, that if we produce energy at the levels that you indicate uh, would be required to sustain 11 billion people at, at the lifestyle of present-day you know, Westerners, that the heat that's created by these whatever energy sources we use, uh, except perhaps solar and wind, that, that heat alone will warm up the planet. I haven't done the calculations. Uh, the only calculations I have had the opportunity to participate in uh, was when I was a technology uh, strategist. So I have taken part in projects that analyze, you know, energy consumption, what are the alternatives, what are the patterns of consumption, what are the alternatives. So I, when I talk about nuclear technology, I think I know what I'm talking about. Um, regarding heat production, it's the first time I hear the argument. It sounds perfectly plausible to me. How can we get rid uh, of heat? Well, there are technologies that can do that um, uh, from uh, um, solar uh, reflection uh, materials. Uh, to, there, there's a number of technologies to, to do something about heat, but they also consume energy. Uh, it's not for nothing that your refrigerator consumes energy. I mean, your refrigerator is not getting rid of heat. It's just moving heat from inside to the outside. So it's heat neutral. But um, there can be technologies that get, that get uh, rid of heat through pressure. Um, but they consume energy too. So, yeah, m my point is it's not a walk in the park to just say, well, let's embrace nuclear, let's develop the latest nuclear technologies, and then we will hold hands and sing the Kumbaya. I don't think that's going to be the case. But I think of all the hard paths we have ahead, 
this is the most promising with the rocks that will be on the way, with the difficult problems we will have to solve. I think this is the only one that offers a perspective for, for 11 billion people living with some level of comfort. For me, it seems very novel. I mean, all I've heard about nuclear energy has been uh, negative. So to see here another uh, approach is is quite refreshing. I think I just learned recently that Germany, for example, is decommissioning all of its nuclear reactors. I don't have a problem with decommissioning old dangerous reactors. They are proven dangerous and then they produce a lot of waste. So I don't have a problem with that, but I have a problem when a government says, and we will no longer do any research on nuclear reactors and we will not build any new ones. Okay, now it's irrational. You see, you start on a path for very good reasons and then you forget to stop. And then you go over the end of that path and uh, right into the land of absurdity and unre unreason. And, and you think you're still on that promising path uh, that you originally uh, set, set out on. Um, I think that's uh, counterproductive. Today in the U.S., um, you are not allowed to build a prototype of new nuclear technologies. Now, I think that is unreasonable. I, I would go as far as to say this is suicidal because when you are facing oblivion and, and the only escape route you have, you arbitrarily decree, okay, that's not allowed. <laughs> what are we doing? I mean, um, there are there is a segment of the population that whatever happens, they will still be comfortable or they think uh, they will. Um, but as an idealist, it's very hard for me uh, to, to say that that's okay. I'm thinking about the people in Bangladesh when they lose their country because sea levels will rise and completely swamp uh, their country. I mean, th these are human beings and the, the, the eye behind their eyes is the same eye behind my eyes and your eyes. Um, so I think this is a very, very, very big problem um, that uh, we should not dismiss. And even even to appeal to people who do not have the capacity for empathy, even if you're extremely egocentric and you think if you are safe, then it's fine, whatever happens to, to those brown people uh, down south, um, they will not go quietly. What do you think they will do? That they will, okay, they will be okay uh, drowning and not having uh, uh, water to drink or what to eat? Of course they will not. And they shouldn't either. So uh, our comfort should not be taken for granted either. There will be a reaction. And when you have a, a large proportion of 11 billion reacting, what do you think is going to happen? So I think it's also a security issue for Western countries. It shouldn't be looked upon only with the eyes of charity because that's not what it is. One, it's decency. It's basic human decency. And two, if you need to go that far, it's a matter of security, too. You want to have security? Make sure these 11 billion people can have a decent life. You couched your argument for nuclear power in the in terms of a letter to Bill Gates, and you refer to him as an extraordinary individual who is, uh, in in effect, become a historical figure in his own lifetime. A, a person who has great power to influence the course of world events, and uh, naturally, as such, uh, many people project negativity onto him, in, including. Uh, viewers of this channel, in fact, including at least one person who has been a guest on this channel, uh, regard Bill Gates as, as potentially an evil person who was uh, somehow involved with the uh, Wuhan Viral Institute and the dissemination of the coronavirus and who has ambitions to implant microchips into everybody's brain so that they can be controlled by the new world order. Uh, uh, how, how is one to address that sort of thing? Or do you even see a need to address it? Well, um, I, I would not commit the error of um, ignoring the seismic moves of, the, of, our, of our collective human unconscious. I'm not going to say that, uh, well, this is deplorable. It's a conspiracy theory. That we can safely ignore it. I would not do that. I would just say this. We can... We can be exposed to or create all kinds of narratives that are impossible to disprove. 
there might be a teapot in the orbit of Saturn right now. I cannot disprove it. There might exist a flying spaghetti monster that controls all nature and which is invisible to us. I cannot disprove that. So I can come up with a million narratives that I cannot disprove. So is it interesting to ask, can you disprove that? No, it's not interesting to ask. It's a question wh whose answer is obvious and the answer is no. And it doesn't mean much. I think the interesting question is to look at what we know um, or to consider what we have reasons to believe in. What reasons do you have, do we have to grant plausibility to a certain narrative? What is abundantly obvious to me is that Bill Gates has invested a large amount of his money and the money of his equally rich friends um, in trying to, to, to do a lot of good in this world. Do I believe that uh, he had the right motivation for that? I, I absolutely believe it because I think when you accumulate money to the level he did, the only possible meaning to your life is to do good. There's nothing else for you to do. You already have your yacht. You already have your, you know, your fantastic wife. You've fallen already the love of your life. Your kids who went to college. You have your mansion. You, you know, you, you, you have it. You name it, you have it. What is left? It's to do good. It's basic in human psychology. Uh, when you get to that point, you either want to destroy everything or you want to do good. And I think in his case, I think it's very, very plausible uh, very easy for me to believe, certainly easier to believe than any of the alternative narratives, that he is today a force for good good in the world. Look, when I was a kid, I'm, I'm a computer engineer as well. There are all kinds of computers here behind me, including the computers I make myself. So um, my heroes were Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, um, especially Wozniak, because he was a real engineer. And Bill Gates was an evil figure uh, for us back in the 80s. You know, he was the evil guy from Microsoft that uh, went dominate the world, the, the world. And he probably was an obnoxious uh, human being <laughs> for quite a while in his life. Do I think that's important? No, I think it's utterly unimportant whether the guy is pleasant to, to work for or live with or not. I think what is important uh, is the, the difference he makes uh, uh, to the world. And I think that uh, Bill Gates and Elon Musk uh, will be recorded in history above uh, Steve Jobs. I think uh, these two guys will, will go down in history as more relevant, more important figures in, in the development of human civilization than my hero, Steve Jobs. And, and it's not easy for me to say that. Part of me is bitter that I'm saying that. But, you know, that's what I actually think. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me see if I can take the conversation now to a, another level, potentially a deeper level. I, I don't know who it was. Maybe it was Einstein. I'm not sure who said that the, the most important question that we need to ask is, is the universe friendly? And I know there was a, a cult of people or a large, many cults probably at one time in history that thought, no, that we are under the control of evil entities, archons, uh, the Gnostics generally uh, believe this was true. And then the Catholic Church went to great lengths to wipe them out a, 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 as a horrible heresy. How do you stand on that issue? Do I think the universe is friendly. Look, if you are set loose in the middle of space, halfway between the Earth and the Moon, it's not friendly. Um, um, if you are set loose in nature on this planet from which we arise, um, just go around naked in the African savanna for a week and see what happens. It's not friendly. Um, does it mean that it's evil in the sense that our culture sort of attributes to, to the word evil, like something that is premedit in a premeditated way wants to inflict pain. No, that I don't think. And I think evil interpreted that way is not natural. It may happen, but it's not natural. You know, the, the question of evil has been in my mind a lot uh, recently. 
um, I think it's very important for us to recognize the evil in ourselves so we understand the nature of evil instead of projecting it outwards and just blaming the world and saying it's the archons, we are not responsible, it's them. Uh, that's so easy. Um, so I went recently down this path of, okay, where can I find evil in my life? I'm not a particularly evil person, so it's not it's not an easy exercise, but I did find um, I found, I remembered when I was a, a teen, uh, I don't know, 13, 14, and I would say this now to you with a considerable amount of shame. I killed a possum. And you may go and think if you're cynical, you may go and say, ah, oh, Bernardo, come on, that thing looks like a rat anyway, you should get rid of it anyway. But when you leave idealism like I do, philosophy for, philosophy for me is not a conceptual exercise. It, 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 no, it's not, some, it's not a board game. For me, it's, it's embodied. Philosophy for me is embodied. The pain of that possum is my pain. And I killed that possum for absolutely no reason, just because possums had a, had a, had a bad rap. The mother of a friend of mine once talked about possums stealing her birds or killing. I don't, don't remember what it was, but I came across a possum and I thought, oh, and there is something about being an, an adolescent. You sort of try to reassert your own control over the planet and over life. And so I started analyzing, trying to recover you know, tune back into what I was feeling when I killed that possum. And it was amazing how possible it is to, to go back into that state of over three decades ago and feel again what I felt back then. And I asked, is this evil like we define in our culture? Did I want to inflict pain? No. And now what I'm going to say now will probably be completely not understandable for the vast majority of people. If I had to describe the feeling that motivated what I did with one word, I would say curiosity. The curiosity of how will it feel to kill an, another mammal? Now, isn't that evil? That's evil. I, I, I killed a possum with a two by four. For absolutely no reason. That thing was just going about its business, trying to find food early evening. And then he chanced upon, by bad luck, against this crazy human adolescent with a two by four. And I already apologized to that possum so many times in my head at night. I've cried over that possum. Um, and I recognized the evil. And and then I thought, what do I do? There was one night I, I, it came out of me, I, I asked the possum for forgiveness. And then immediately that, that anger came in me, that no, you are not to be forgiven. You, that's the last thing you want is to be forgiven. You should not be forgiven. And I realized I will never forgive myself. And it's a good thing that possum, that evil, has to live with me. It has to be assimilated and become part of me. I have, I have to be with that for the rest of my life and for all eternity. That act of evil has to be with me. I have to own it. I cannot get rid of it. I cannot be forgiven or forgive myself. So I feel light and and forget about it. Oh, it's in the past and and get over it and outgrow. No, no. That to me is what. Evil, it, it, it's the way to deal with evil. Uh, own it, own it and, and feel it from the other side, which is what I'm incapable of not doing anymore. Every time I think by that possum, I, I re-experience what happened from his point of view. And, and the shame that comes with it is sometimes absolutely overwhelming, overwhelming the shame and it's not like I am, like I think of myself as particularly bad. I think I am, I'm part of nature like every human being. But by the same token that I've become almost incapable of judging people fundamentally recently, I'm also not capable of judging myself fundamentally. Um, 
but I don't forgive myself for that. And I think it's right for me to not forgive myself. That possum has is that possum that life is interlinked with mine for all eternity. And that link can never be broken anymore. When you take another life, you are forever entangled with the life you've taken. The problem is today that we've sanitized this. We call it the food industry. Um, because what I did to that possum was not as bad as what happens to millions of higher animals every day killed under clinical conditions in a way that is uh, safeguarded by law and by ethicists. Um, and, and that's when it that's when evil goes wrong. It goes wrong when we reject it, when we project it and we say it's the acorn. The, the, how are they called? Acorn? A archons, archons, yeah. Acorns, archons, yeah. It's the archons. archons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we say it's the archons, no, it's not the archons. The evil that any human being has ever done in the world is the evil that exists in each and every one of us in potentiality because we all share our humanity. It's not there, it's here. And the way to go about it is one, to look at it and say, I give you the right to exist. I am not going to say that your existence is illegitimate. You're part of nature. You're part of me. I, I, I see you. I recognize you. But, and now the two important things. I will not give you free reign because I am a metacognitive thinking human being endowed with the ability to discern morality. So I'm not going to give you free reign, number one. And number two, whatever you do, Mr. or Mrs. Evil, I will own it. And it will be with me forever. And it will never be taken out of me. That's how I go about it. That possum will be with me when I die in my deathbed. It sounds as if what you're saying, though, when you say you will own whatever other people do, if, if I heard you correctly, it means you're, you're taking responsibility for the slaughter of, of innocent animals and innocent children and innocent people. I think we have, uh, to a large degree, personal responsibility. I mean, um, I, I don't eat meat uh, very often. I certainly don't eat uh, red meat, maybe once a year with friends. Um, but I do eat occasionally meat. That meat I ate was killed on my account because I bought it. That's my personal responsibility too. And, and we have a responsibility at the level of the species. We all share our humanity. Our humanity is capable of Hitler. Let's not forget this. Uh, Hitler was a human being too. To say that he was an aberration, that he was a deplorable is to try to amputate something that is inherent in us. Now, I may not be capable of a lot of that evil. And there, there, there are kinds of evil I cannot relate. For instance, I, I, I can relate with killing because I killed that possum uh, out of some kind of dark curiosity, but at the same time, childish curiosity. But evil, because evil is judged by the actions, right? By the result, not by the intent. Um, I, I cannot relate with other things. There are, for instance, I, I've tried this exercise in introspection. I cannot relate with certain sexual deviations that are criminal. I, I, I cannot relate to it. I cannot, I cannot enter into it. But at least from a conceptual level, I, I understand that human beings are born in such a way that uh, they are motivated to do those things that they cannot relate to at all. They are human beings too. They have, you know, DNA <laughs> like I have. They share 99 point something percent of my DNA. They are much, much more similar to me than I am, than I am to my beloved cat who is incapable of evil. Or is he? He killed a shrew the other day. So that's evil too, sort of. <laughs> because he didn't need to kill that shrew. He had his food. Um, but I think we should take ownership of what our species do, each and every one of us, for the mere fact that we are humans. We should take ownership for what humans in general do. I think it's a very healthy attitude towards life. 
Well, I have to agree with you, uh, Bernardo. I, for example, worked for a while at uh, San Quentin Prison when I was a graduate student in criminology. I was in the uh, psychiatric unit doing group therapy with the murderers and sex offenders. And my supervisor at the time was constantly telling me, these are a different kind of cat. That that was his phrase, different kind of cat, as, as if they weren't human a, at all. And something in me uh, rejected that notion. They were very human, in fact, only slightly different from myself. Uh, it struck me that, you know, everybody deserves, I, I, the word I use is respect. There, there's no reason not to treat even even a murderer, even a rapist, even someone who uh, sexually abuses children with with some measure of respect just for their humanity. Yeah, yeah, and and if at all possible, and and I don't say this as <clears throat> to to justify any kind of crime. I don't think crime is to be tolerated in a society because it's dysfunctional, not because it's unnatural. Obviously, it's natural. It happens. It it happens in every corner of this planet, in every civilization, at all points of history. Crimes have been committed in abundance. So it, to say that it's not natural is like trying to blind yourself to a degree that is almost, you know, laughable. Um, it is part of nature. Um, and to say this is not to excuse it. It's not to give it free reign. But if you don't acknowledge that, if you don't acknowledge the existence of the evil in our species, of the evil in us even, uh, personally, um, then we create the conditions for that evil to control us. Because that which you reject, as the pro proverb goes, right, uh, keep your friends close and your enemies even closer. And there is a lot of wisdom to that because you can monitor what's happening when you keep your enemies closer. If you shut them away, they will plot against you without your knowing. And then they will spring a trap on you when you least expect. The same goes with the evil in us. If we declare out of, I don't know, philosophical a priori principles, if we arbitrarily declare that the evil don't, doesn't belong in us, doesn't belong in this society, and what we see of it is some kind of aberration that we lock away and, and forget about it, then it will surprise us. It will surprise us when the minister who has preached the Gospels for all his life commits a crime, and, and the whole community will go like, oh my God, how could that possibly happen. Well, that's what happens when you look at evil and you say, you don't exist. I reject you. You're not part of me. You're not part of God's plan. You are shut out. That's when it comes back by, <laughs> from your backside and, and pinches you in the butt in a very unpleasant way because then you don't see it anymore. I think it's much healthier to talk to the evil in you and say, look, I acknowledge your existence. You, too, are part of me, but I shall not give you free reign. That's the way to go. Bernardo Castrop, this has been a very stimulating conversation. I love the idea of doing open-ended conversations like this. I had no idea when we started that, that we would end up here, uh, but it's fascinating and, and very heartfelt. I, I really appreciate the way you opened up your heart. Uh, and I'm sure our viewers will appreciate it as well. Uh, this is our 10th conversation, incidentally, and I hope that we have many, many more. Bernardo, thank you so much for being with me. Thanks for having me. It's been a great pleasure again. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.